Hi, everybody. Welcome to Exegetically Speaking, a podcast to the friends and faculty of Wheaton College, Wheaton, Illinois. And this year, our second season, we're doing something a little different. We are partnering with the Lanier Theological Library in Houston, Texas, to bring you these podcasts. My name is David Capes, and I'm the Senior Research Fellow at Lanier Library. And our purpose in these podcasts is pretty simple. We want to promote the study of biblical languages, Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic, so that we can read the Bible more faithfully, study it more fully, and not just read it, but to live it. Joining me today is a great honor, Dr. Philip Graham Riken, the president of Wheaton College and professor of theology. Dr. Riken, thank you. David, it's great to be on the podcast. I, I love what you do with exegetically speaking, and I, I admire the work of the Lanier Theological Library, and I, I feel like this is a great fit for us. You know, we, we love to take the biblical languages seriously at Wheaton College, both in our undergrad Bible and theology program, right. but also, as you know, from your work at Wheaton with our graduate programs. And it's great, great to be able to talk about the Word of God and to try to get as close to the original as we can. I know. Just, we're just digging deeper and deeper, aren't we? That's what we're trying to do with the languages, because they're so rich. Yeah. And, you know, in contrast, perhaps to some of the people that you have on this podcast, David, I am far from an expert you know, I'm, I, I recognize the difference between a legitimate Old Testament or New Testament scholar and somebody who does the kind of pastoral work that I do. But I'm very grateful for the grounding I had in the biblical languages at Wheaton College, at Westminster Theological Seminary, the way that that influenced mm. my doctoral work in historical theology at Oxford. And just again and again in my work reading, studying, and particularly teaching and preaching the Bible, having a familiarity and a recognition of some of the issues with the original languages, it, it makes a difference to really understanding the Bible and then figuring out what the practical implications might be. Good, good. Well, let's look today at Jeremiah 29.7. That's, it's, I love the book of Jeremiah, first of all, and uh, it's a rich place because th there's, there are a variety of kind of styles and genres just at work there. So what's going on in 29.7 that we need to pay attention yeah. to? So it's interesting you mentioned genres and styles. The way I look at the book, David, is I compare it to a scrapbook. This mm. is a prophet's scrapbook of a lifetime in ministry and it has, you know, a little, little poem that he wrote when he was in despair. It has some newspaper clippings of some of the things that were happening in ancient Israel in his day. It has That's some of his image. personal reflections. Yeah. Some of the variety, um, if you're frustrated that it doesn't sort of hang together the same way that a gospel does, it's not meant to. It's a scrapbook. This is a really important part of the scrapbook. It's a letter. You'd find that in a lot of scrapbooks, a letter that you might have received from a friend or one that you sent to somebody that you wanted to save. The situation here is that the people of God have fallen under judgment. Hmm. The better part of the leadership uh, of Jerusalem has been carried off to exile in Babylon. And of course, they're in great despair and discouragement. I mean, they've seen people they love die in the streets. They're, they're refugees. They're, they've been in chains. They're far from home. I mean, just all the things that we see in the world today and more with, you know, some 60 million refugees. Exactly. Uh, that's part of the experience the people of God had been through. And they get this letter from the faithful prophet Jeremiah writing to them in Babylon from Jerusalem with some very specific directions. And if, if I may, I'll just Please. read yeah, thanks. Jeremiah 29, verse 7, reading here in the English Standard Version. Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare, you will find your welfare. Interesting. Uh, this is maybe the biblical version of a rising tide will lift all boats. Oh. Here the people of God are challenged to seek and to pray for the, quote unquote, in this translation, welfare mm. Mm. of this secular, pagan, godless city for this reason, that as God blesses that city, he will also bless his people in that city. Mm. So you'll probably have to interrupt me, David, if you want to get a word <laughs> in edgewise. I know my family would say that and maybe some of my colleagues, uh, particularly when I'm you know, getting into a great Bible passage like this. I think this verse has become very familiar because there's been a real recovery in evangelical circles in the last several decades of a theology, a practical theology of doing God's work in the city. And this is one of the texts that people have looked to mm. because it's saying, don't reject the city. 
don't write off the city, actually invest in the city, seek God's blessing in the city, pray for the city. And a key word in this verse, which shows up three times, is the word welfare. Welfare, yeah. Some translations will say peace. Maybe I, I probably should have done a little more looking at some what some of the other ones. It's the biblical word shalom, which I think is a, a word that people are familiar with. Sure, yeah. It is the biblical word for peace. You do hear in some circles, hey, shalom isn't just peace, the absence of conflict. This mm. is a comprehensive sense of well-being. Mm -hmm. That may be over reading just the word a bit. I think you have to see in the context what peace means. And I think the English word for peace, similarly, you know, can have a more minimal or more comprehensive sense. Yeah, yeah. A couple of things strike me here. I mean, one is the repetition of the word. You know, the Hebrew doesn't have exclamation marks. It uses <laughs> or repetition. Bold. There's no bold. No, there's no there. bold. There's no italics. But but yeah. repetition is the biblical way of really emphasizing and underscoring something. So this is all about, however we translate it, welfare, peace, shalom. Now, mm. here's where I think an awareness of the original language comes in in this verse. And that is, I think it's really important to see this verse in the context of Psalm 122. Ah, okay. And Psalm 122 is in the English Standard Version, the word there is translated as peace, not welfare. Mm. So I don't know all the reasons why they chose one word in one context or another word in another context. And I think that's appropriate. Sometimes the same word, because we've got a nuance in English and there are a couple of different ways a word can be understood, it should be different in one mm -hmm. place than another in the Bible. Exactly. But yeah. what you might miss is if there's a connection between those passages. If you just see welfare in one place and peace in another place, you may not see that there's a connection. Do you think, do you think Jeremiah might've known that Psalm? Is it absolutely. possible? Okay. Yeah, so the I Psalm think, is absolutely. maybe earlier than. Yeah. So, and I, you know, this is a Psalm that was used by the people of God when they were going up for worship mm -hmm. in the house of God. It's one of those songs of ascent people from all over Israel, even in, communities like Anathoth, where Jeremiah grew up, would go to Jerusalem for the big festivals. And in particular, at the end of Psalm 122, there is this very strong word of prayer of blessing for the city of God, Jerusalem. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And then it goes, peace be within your walls. Peace be within you. There's a, a repetition here also of the word shalom. And I think if you were a Jewish exile in Babylon mm. and you got this really radical, maybe almost contradictory message from the prophet Jeremiah, hey, don't pray against Babylon, pray for its peace, pray for its welfare. And you had said, I don't know, I don't know how to, like, how would I ever pray for the peace of a city or how, how would I pray for the peace of Babylon? Mm. Well, you, here's your prayer. Yeah. It's already ready to hand. You've already been praying as part of your annual religious worship rituals. You've been praying for the peace of Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. As you go up to the, to the temple. Yeah. And now in Babylon, I think Jeremiah is saying, hey, pray this prayer even for your captors mm. as part of the way that God is going to bless you in this community. And if we had more time, David, I would take us to Psalm 137 because that's a prayer of judgment against Babylon. And I think, I think Jeremiah is partly saying, Hey, don't use Psalm 137 when you're praying about Babylon, uh, pray 122 or, or maybe pray both of them in a, in a certain sense. Right, right. But I think there's an important connection here that puts the prayers of the people of God in an exile situation into perspective. And we should be praying for blessing. Here's a takeaway for us. We should be praying for blessing, peace, welfare, shalom, whatever you want to call it. We should be praying that on our communities, hmm. Even on people that are against the gospel, that's part of the way God's going to bless us. As he blesses those around us in our communities, he's going to bless us as well. I think there's a deeper peace in Jesus Christ that we can be praying as a blessing on the enemies of God. I think there's hmm. a deeper gospel understanding that we can bring to these passages. But I, I think an understanding of the biblical terminology really unfolds a much richer context for Jeremiah 29, verse 7. That's that's terrific. That's a great word. And and where you are praying for the peace now of Chicago, 
and where I am praying for the peace of, of Houston and all the other great cities around. But the, that's, that's where we happen to be located at this particular moment, right, where God has us. And all the people around us are in need of prayer, prayer for blessing, prayer for re- the gift of repentance, pray, prayer for the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit, and also prayer for just the material, material blessings, whatever health, safety, security, justice is needed in our communities. We should be praying for all of that. Right. Dr. Riken, thanks for being with us today on Exegetic. Thank Speaking. you, Dr. Capes. Thanks as well to Sylvia Vasquez, Rebecca Larson, and Krista Sanchez for helping us edit and produce this podcast. If you want to study biblical languages, the best place you could go is Wheaton College. They have the best program hands down than any other school, whether you want to study at the graduate or undergraduate level. So go to the website, www.wheaton.edu, and look for modern and classical languages. Get started there today. If you have questions about this podcast, comments, we'd love to hear from you. Contact us at exegetically.speaking at wheaton.edu. That's exegetically.speaking at wheaton.edu. Thanks for listening.